to say that for the first time in We Are West Ham podcast history, we're bringing you a live broadcast, and I, by, I say live, it's not live at all, it's pre-recorded, but from abroad, West Ham United playing away in Europe. I know we've done it at Genk, we've done it at Rapid Vienna, and we've done it against the other unknown European club that we've played against in the group stage, but this week we play Sevilla away. We beat Manchester City in the Manchester City Cup earlier this season and now we aim to beat Sevilla in the Sevilla Cup this week on Thursday night. I'm delighted to say that joining me as an official employee from Sevilla FC is Daniel McGuinness. Excuse his accent. You might think, hang on a minute, he doesn't sound very Spanish if you ask me. It's because he's from Northern Ireland. He's a big dog in the Sevilla social media team and I'm delighted to say that he's joining us today on the We Are West Ham podcast to chat all things to be ahead of that Europa League clash on Thursday, potentially the biggest game in West Ham's history. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us. What a setting this is, by the way, and this is your life, week in, week out. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, you're not wrong, sitting here in the sun in March, it's not a bad place here, Seville. And yeah, whenever the draw was made... Seeing West Ham, obviously, you know, for being a Premier League fan, it was an exciting draw, and that's good to have you over and have a little chat about the game. Middle of March, me and Dad have come out this morning, disappointed to see the rain on the floor. Uh, we got to what are we now, 20 past five in the evening. You've rocked up in a coat. Dad's desperate to take his jumper off and get the shorts out. Um, we're, we're, we're absolutely loving it. There was rain on the floor as we landed this morning on Tuesday. It, is this your life, day in, day out? Yeah, was, you probably brought the rain over with you from England. <laughs> but no, nah, actually, as I was saying before, this is a little bit chilly for March. Like, you know, I'd, I'd be expecting five or so more degrees. <laughs> but no, nah, I think whenever you live here for a while, you get used to the temperature, like Sevilla... The weather here is ridiculous, like you're talking come May time, it'll be 30 degrees every day, and then come come July, August, you're 40, and that's way too much, like even civilians, you won't see them out in the streets, so we do have our, you know, the two months of summer aren't the most pleasant in terms of being out in the beating sun, but other than that, in Europe it must have the best climate around, like I can't think of anywhere that beats it, and you get very, very little rain, so it's not a bad place to be. Fair play, mate, fair play. I think from my point of view and the point of view of the listeners, that's probably enough weather chat. Um, for those of you who are used to impeccable audio from me and Jonesy, Jonesy isn't here at the moment, unfortunately he's up in Scotland on a work do. He's assured me he will be watching the game and I'll be linking up with him later on in the evening on the podcast. The tram's rattling by, there's people, locals enjoying a beer on this sunny Tuesday evening in March, people riding bikes around in, I must say, a very haphazard fashion. The <laughs> cycling lanes in the city doing no good whatsoever for my anxiety levels. But we're here to talk about football. Your life sounds absolutely awesome work, working for Sevilla day in, day out. We are here to talk about football. You admitted to me earlier on that you have never spoken to a West Ham fan in your entire life. So, first of all, you're welcome for this fantastic new experience. <laughs> Uh, this evening chatting to me and my dad having us bend your ear about life in East London and Essex and what it's like supporting the mighty Hammers you, uh, it's fair to say have adapted yourself having worked for Sevilla for a long time, you're now a Sevilla fan uh, so automatically you're used to more success than me and my club are uh, what, for, the, for those of us you know, the, the, the listeners to the podcast who might not know much about Sevilla, their history, their recent history, their long-term history. What can you tell us about the club that you have now grown to love? So obviously I think having lived in the UK, Ireland, I think people do know Sevilla, but not very well. I think people would know them as they're, oh, they're that team that win the Europa League <laughs> usually. Obviously that's the stereotype that you have of Sevilla, but not many people would know that we were on the verge of bankruptcy back in 1999, 2000. We started the 21st century in the second division. Uh, the president at the time, uh, Roberto Ales, 
Ibrahimovic. What a pronunciation that was, by the way. He told us man studied Spanish. <laughs> so he even said, uh, you know, he later went on to say that there wasn't even enough money to pay for extra balls at training. So I think it's important to contextualise just what Sevilla have accomplished in these 20, 22 years. We started the 21st century in the second division, got immediately promoted and then a man that perhaps English listeners will have heard about, uh, Mr. Monchi, he got appointed, he was a goalkeeper. After his retirement, he got appointed as director of football. And since that, the club really hasn't looked back, slowly established themselves as a kind of UEFA Cup qualifying team in, uh, in La Liga. UEFA Cup, AK, the tournament that people respected before they changed it to the Europa League, <laughs> and everyone was like, meh. Nah. <laughs> yeah, it was the, the OG, the original, the original uh, Europa League. But yeah, so just kind of got some qualifications for that, and then really everything took off in, uh, in 2006, whenever we won our uh, first UEFA Cup. 4-0 against Middlesbrough and even then you had some you know, famous players you had Dani Alves you had uh, Jesus Navas you had Luis Fabiano you West Ham fans will know uh, Frederick Cunute so you know in six years Monchi built a very very strong team with very little money at his disposal then we went on to win the uh, UEFA Cup immediately again the next year uh, a 2 all draw against Espanyol winning on penalties and then we had a little break. You know, we let other people have a chance. <laughs> a little break from success, yeah, yeah. Also known as the entire time I've supported West Ham has been a break from success, yeah. But yeah. Well, yeah, then obviously the UEFA Cup got remodelled as the Europa League. Unai Emery, as uh, your English listeners I'm sure will, will know, he came in, won three back to back Europa Leagues. Not too bad. And then. You know, we were then kind of with the rule that uh, winning the Europa League qualifies you for the Champions League that was brought in around that time. We started having more appearances in the Champions League, left the Europa League to the side a little bit, but we were back in it in uh, 2020 and uh, got a win in it. So, yeah, certainly we were a team that very much enjoys this competition. And although we are a team that now wants to be in the Champions League, I think Sevilla fans will, you know, this is our competition and we're happy to be, we're happy to be in it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, for West Ham fans this season, playing in the Europa League is, for me, I'm 30 years of age and being in Seville with my dad, watching the team away from home, who I've watched most of the time begrudgingly for 20, 25 years, home and away, going up and down the country, dragging myself to home games on a Saturday to probably be lucky, feel lucky, excuse me, if you've got a one-all draw at home to a rampant Middlesbrough. This feels like, it just feels like another world. It feels like a dream come true. We were saying on the plane over this morning how it feels like a, we feel like we've completed support in West Ham. For, you obviously know where West Ham sit in the, the Premier League echelons if you like um, and although they're probably one of the better supported teams in Europe as far as uh, attendances and things like that go what, what's it like being from a town, a city excuse me, like Sevilla where you've got two teams, Sevilla and Real Betis if anyone didn't already know that, Betis playing Eintracht Frankfurt on Wednesday night in the Europa League what, what's it like being in a city like that where certainly on a European stage your team is regularly more successful so be a second in La Liga at the moment and we'll get on to like, current domestic form but h- how does that feel because in comparison West Ham feel like a big club as far as when we go we're bringing 3,000 fans this week there'll be at least another 1,000 more in the ground no doubt what's it like following a club like that whose European reputation is so huge yet fans in England would probably say well we're a bigger club yeah well you know as I as I said you know we started back in 2000 in the second division so I think not not too long ago Sevilla fans would have been having similar feelings I think whenever you speak to a Sevilla fan about what they felt in 2005, 2006, they'll tell you, you know, it was the it was the pinnacle. But yeah, it has been 15 years now that Sevilla have been amongst the top of European football. So I think 
you know, the club, there's been certainly a shift in mentality. You know, the club over, certainly, I think perhaps those two first UEFA Cup wins were kind of a dream that really no one ever expected. But then whenever Emery came in, won the three uh, Europa Leagues on the trot, and we've consolidated that with top four finishes over the past few years, I think there has been a shift in mentality at the club. And yeah, I think it's you know it's a uh, it's certainly a club where the fans, as you, as you rightfully mentioned, there are two football clubs here, and in Seville, the city, the passion is is huge, absolutely huge. Speaking to Sevillans, you know they'll tell you that possibly it's here in Seville that football is most passionately followed. Obviously, you've got huge footballing cities like Madrid, Barcelona. Perhaps the Sevillans are biased, but they'll tell you that this is where football is, as I said, lived to the full, like with the most passion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because West Ham fans might know at the moment. They probably won't, and they may not have known that Real Betis were based in Sevilla until a the Europa League draw came up, and we were all looking for flights and what airports we had to fly to as soon as the draw was made. Um, and also, perhaps when Manuel Pellegrini took over, a man with uh, a, a somewhat varied reputation among those at the London Stadium. Um, but to focus on to focus on the game this week, Sevilla at the moment. I think there was a mixed reaction among West Ham fans. I know. So last Friday it was when the draw was made. I was sat in front of the TV with the uh, Jao Pinto. I think his name is the guy who does all the Europa League draws. Front in the drawer with Palop uh, as his little assistant, not speaking any English, getting all that translated just absolutely desperate to see who West Ham were going to get in the last 16 of the Europa League uh, I had my laptop set up in front of me with Sky Scanner up just ready to book flights to so wherever we were going straight away just absolutely praying that it wasn't Glasgow Rangers because I'd already booked four days at work four days off work and the last thing I wanted to do was go to Scotland for a long weekend Sevilla came up and immediately straight away I was just buzzing southern Spain March sun's going to be out what a huge European club this is going to be. Booked the flight straight away. And it was only about 24 hours later, after I called my dad, told him the flights in the hotel were booked, that I thought, ah, oh, blimey, I forgot we've actually got a tie to win here and we're almost certainly going to lose. Um, when, you know, what, obviously, West Ham fans are just it's so novel being even this far in the competition. For Sevillans, who are used to winning it three times, as you've mentioned already, what was the reaction uh, in, within the club and then among the fan base when West Ham United were drawn out the hat? Well, I'd say, certainly, considering the opponents that we could have got, I'd say that West Ham would have been up there as one of the ones that we didn't want to get. I think of qualifying teams by their, you know, by their ability, West Ham would certainly be up there with, I think, personally, the teams that I didn't want to get at this stage of the competition would have been West Ham and uh, Bayer Leverkusen. I saw them as the two strongest options. We got West Ham, and yeah, Monchi immediately, you know, in case anyone doesn't know who Monchi is, he's our director of football. He gave a press conference after, and he said that, uh, you know, ideally, you know, we probably wouldn't have wanted to get West Ham at this stage. But then he went on to say, but West Ham probably aren't too happy of getting us either. So I think it's two, I think it's certainly. You know, one of the, if not the most exciting tie of the round, certainly for an English supporter, seeing a team like West Ham come up against a Euro- European Europa League heavyweight. So certainly, I think they're two teams that perhaps would have rather avoided each other at this stage of the round of 16. It's more a tie that you know you'd want to see in the semi-final, final. But that's what the draw is given, and yeah, it'll be two be two teams who are enjoying both positive seasons coming together and we'll see who comes out on top I like the uh, I like that that last little bit of your answer there is very much a severe employee answer Um, West Ham at the moment I would say the former is stuttering Sevilla sitting in second in the league you've got Barcelona beneath them Valencia beneath them all these big be- Atletico Madrid Atletico Madrid excuse me beneath them all these big behemoths of Spanish football only Real Madrid above them at the moment albeit by a reasonable margin I think not only would West Ham have been fearful of, of playing Sevilla in any other season given that 
I think it's generally accepted that Sevilla are one of Spain's top six. But second in the Liga this season, form unlike we've ever seen in Seville before. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong by all means, but I, I think fans of West Ham would go, oh, Sevilla, that's OK. And then they look at La Liga and go, oh, maybe not. Yeah, well, I think we've had our European success throughout the last 15 years, but really where we've seen the upturn in the league has come with Julian Lopetegui, who came in three years ago. And since we appointed him, we haven't really looked back in the league. In his first year, we finished with 70 points and uh, finished fourth in the league, getting us Champions League uh, qualification after one year out of it. Uh, then the following season, he followed that up with 77 points, which was, which was our point record. We finished fourth, but we finished about 20 points above fifth. <laughs> and now this season, obviously, we've and we've kept on improving, as you rightfully say. We're sitting second, and you know, for quite some months now, it's clear that the title race in Spain is between Real Madrid and Sevilla. In the last month, Barcelona have had a very impressive upturn in form under Xavi, has to be said. With Mr. Aubameyang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not too, too badly, he got himself a good few goals. But yeah, so the title race in Spain is Sevilla, Real Madrid. We're doing, I think with Sevilla, the points are there, the points are there certainly, but uh, Sevilla under Lopetegui are a very results-based club. You know, a lot of a lot of one nils, a lot of matches that uh, perhaps you won't go to home. You won't go home thinking, "My word, what a match of football I've seen!" But whenever you're in March and you're eight points behind, <coughs> eight points behind Madrid, we had a disappointing uh, weekend that we drew and Madrid won, so they just opened the gap a little bit, which is disappointing. We still have to play Madrid on Easter Sunday, so you know, as long as we keep Madrid within a reasonable points distance, the title race is still open. Although Madrid did just extend the gap a little bit this weekend. When was the last time that happened? I mean, first of all, when's the last time Sevilla won a title, if ever? This, forgive my lack of La Liga knowledge here. Um, and uh, assuming that's been a, a long, long time, when has it been this close? Yes, so uh, we have won La Liga once. I hope I hope I don't get this wrong. But I were you alive? I certainly was not. It was a long time, even from conception. Was I alive in 1991? <laughs> no, no. We're talking about 19. 19- was my dad alive in 1964? No, nope, we're. <laughs> oh my God. We are talking about 1946. I hope to have not gotten that date wrong, but I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's 1946. So that's the last La Liga title we've Hang got. on, sorry, two secs. I'm just going to ask my dad quickly. Was your dad alive in 1946? Yeah, just... <laughs> he was about four years old, I think. That's my grandfather. So, I mean, we're not exactly talking um, st- La Liga stalwarts here, are we? No, so, like, we've had our love story in European football, but in league football... We, you know, we don't have the titles that obviously a Madrid or a Barcelona, but even say a Valencia can back up. So yeah, it's certainly been a long time. Well, geez, decades, decades since we've won the league. Our last big title race that would have been in the uh, 2006 season under uh, Juan de Ramos. Uh, Tottenham legend. Mm, yeah, yeah. Not, you know, I'm sure Tottenham fans will remember him. And I think, you know. Uh, as if I remember correctly, I think it was just the last couple of days of the season that we just missed out, but we kept Barcelona in a title race until, you know, match day 35, 36 or whatever. And that was really, that's the last time that we've challenged for the title. So this, you know, it's a huge season, what's happening this season. Yeah. Um, so, given that, it's, it's probably fair to say West Ham fans looking at it can think, oh, Jesus, not only are we coming up against a serious European heavyweight, we're coming up against a serious European heavyweight. Also in, forgive my turn of phrase, because we don't normally swear on the We Are West Ham podcast, but shit hot form. Given that, I guess that can be looked at in two ways. On one hand, you can look at it and go, Jesus, this is a serious football team we're coming up against this week. On the other hand, you can go, you know what? These guys haven't won a league title since the last World War and we're just about into the third one and they might do it again so therefore they might just feel like the Europa League slightly takes a back seat is that a reasonable way of thinking of it or is it more that you mentioned the gap between Sevilla and Real Madrid that perhaps they go you know what 
coming second is still a monumental achievement for this football club and if we can back that up with Europa League success then this could be one of the most historic campaigns we've ever had. I think looking at it objectively I think it would have to be the latter. Of course to win the title, to win La Liga for Sevilla would be oh, insane. I can't even imagine what it would mean for the club but I think second as well would be a huge achievement. And as I was kind of saying earlier, off air, the relationship that this club have with the Europa League, I think the respect that this club has for the Europa League means that they will not uh, in any way rest on their laurels. Just last night, uh, no, two nights ago, the club had their postponed uh, Christmas dinner, postponed because of the outbreak of Omicron here. And uh, the president had a speech at the end, and you know he made specific reference to the Europa League that the final is being played in the Sancho Pizjuan in our stadium. So I think, of all the possibilities, the possibility that Sevilla don't give the Europa League their full attention isn't one that exists. I think we will, even though we do want to do our best in La Liga, I think the love story really that we have with this competition means that we'll give it absolutely 100% yeah, such a different mindset and rhetoric to the annoying boring snooze fest we hear in England a lot of the time about clubs resting players West Ham fans particularly 100% well maybe 95% percent united behind the fact that this competition means the most of all of us that it has for such a long time and it's so refreshing to hear that from a club who even though they're in the title race for the first time in three generations still this competition means as much to them as it does mm. to our club look a little bit more technical stuff then Dan uh, Sevilla again you're, you're talking to an audience who perhaps we normally do opposition views of Premier League teams who our listeners watch and are aware of week in, week out. Uh, I think most people at the moment will know Sevilla. If they thought of a Sevilla player, they think Anthony Martial because he's been signed from Manchester United recently. Uh, as far as playing staff goes, before we get on to the, the way the game's going to work out on Thursday, who are the, the big players to watch out for, the big star names that perhaps some of our listeners may have heard of and, and ones that they may not have heard of? Um, who you think they should be aware of. So certainly the strength of this uh, Lopetegui side, this Lopetegui Sevilla side, is the defence. You know, I think we've either, I was remember doing an article the other day, we've either got the same amount of clean sheets or conceded the same amount of goals as Man City. So we're, to, we're top in Europe in terms of some defensive statistic. I can't quite remember off my head. It doesn't matter. Just, <laughs> say, just say you're level on Man City or something. You're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so like we're built off a strong defence. So, naturally, I'd have to label some defenders. I think what players that uh, English fans will know, I'm sure some will remember Jesus Navas, you know, a bombing right winger for Man City. And back, back for Sevilla in the day, but he's now been converted into a very trusty right back. Still gets forward, but he does the majority of his work in the defensive part of the pitch. Sounds very much like my football career, to be quite honest with me. Yeah, he used to be pacey and then just bang him a right back. And then I think Chelsea fans will certainly have heard about Jules Koundé, a very, very impressive young French centre back, you know, in my opinion destined to be one of the best top centre backs in world football if, if he isn't if he isn't already perhaps some Arsenal fans I remember rumours a couple of years ago that Arsenal were looking to, or no Newcastle fans of course just this past January transfer window Diego Carlos, another incredibly strong centre back, absolute beast of a man, I think Koundé is the more perhaps wily defender who'll cover up behind but Diego Carlos is the man that a 50-50 is a 90-10 in Diego Carlos's favour. He's an absolute monster of a man. Our left-back, Marco Acuna, is incredibly impressive as well. But if I had to say who the biggest or most impressive talent is, it has to be our goalkeeper, Yassine Bonu. I think in a league that has Courtois, Oblak, Ter Stegen, he does go under the radar. But if you look at the stats, we're talking about one of the best goalkeepers in the world. So I think, you know, up front... I don't think there's the same names, but in the defence, in the defence, there's certainly a lot of talent. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, you mentioned all those names there, there's players who've been linked to the Premier League. 
Um, I mean, that happens all the time. It's frustrating. We've got Declan Rice, one of the finest midfielders in, in Europe at the moment. Uh, the, the, a club like Sevilla, the, are those players... Obviously, you're an employee of the club, so I, I totally understand where you're coming from. You've mentioned like the, the dual screen dangerous was quite well documented. I think Thomas Tuchel's spoken about it. Um, is that does that get boring when you've got good players and you feel you consider yourself a good club to continually see them linked with? And I'm putting these in quote marks for anyone just listening to this rather than watching. Bigger clubs, or is there a feeling in Spain? Well, no, we're, we are a big club. Look at our European success. Look at our La Liga success. Like we can hold on to these players. Mm. I think the change in mentality that I mentioned earlier has a lot to do with this. Back in the day, back in the day, as I was mentioning, we had very little funds and we were happy to see that interest. We were happy to sell Danny Alves to Barcelona. We were happy to sell Jose Antonio Reyes to Arsenal. Cause that Another great pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> that really, that kept the club going. That kept the club going and that was Monchi's tactic. You know, buy, buy low and sell high and so for Sevilla, even with this Kunde interest, Diego Carlos interest, I think for us, you know, we're very used to it. But what we're not used to is that we haven't given given in. Back in back in the day, we would have sold the player. You know, I think Monchi. You know, Monchi came out in a press conference and confirmed the price that was offered for Kunde. It was in and around 55 million euros, which for for Sevilla that would be our record sale by quite some margin. But you know, Monchi and Lopetegui and the board made the decision that. You know, we don't have a rich owner. You know, like a lot of clubs in Spain, we're just owned by a president. We don't have any, you know, foreign funds coming in from anywhere. So we will need to sell in order to keep generating funds. But I think at the start of the season, a kind of agreement was made that we kind of identified Messi had just left Barcelona. And you couldn't sign him. <laughs> in the past few years, Madrid haven't been, you know, Ronaldo, you know, La Liga, I think the quality has dropped a little bit with the. Uh, you know, with uh, losing Ronaldo and Messi, so I think at the start of the season, the club kind of thought, if this is going to be, if it's going to be any year, this is the year. So we agreed to, you know, we kept Koundé on. We fought off Newcastle in uh, in January for Diego Carlos. So I think the club's very used to seeing, you know, Premier League interest in the players, and I think it's a good thing for the club because in, in some moment we will have to sell. Monchi said that we will have to sell some players, but we just decided that. It wasn't the right moment to do it. Yeah, I'd, uh, that must be great for the fans to hear that. that like, I think everyone knows if you've got good players, there's going to be interest. But it must be great for Sevilla fans to see your club digging in and going, nah, we are Sevilla and this is what we're going to try and do this year. If it doesn't work out, then fine. But we're going to give it at least give it a crack because that's what the fans deserve. Right, Dan, let's talk about the game this week. Huge game for West Ham United. Potentially not as big. Uh, in severe size. Obviously, you've, you've made it clear already they, they value the competition. Uh, I would imagine just historically, because you've been here before, you've got through these rounds before, you've won the flipping final before, uh, the, the fact that all the West Ham fans coming out, at least 3,000 up to 4,000 rumoured to be coming out to Spain this week. Um, that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge game. It's a huge game. It's a huge game for the club. And... Uh, I, I just go with it. It's an absolutely huge game for the club, and given that you, you've mentioned the players that, that Sevilla have gotten there, I mean, first of all, before we get into the technicalities, which you will, all I'm looking forward to after that little uh, monologue from you about Diego Carlos Newcastle target or not and how good he is in a 50-50 Craig Dawson versus Diego Carlos who wins I think that's the battle that everyone's looking to see <laughs> that'll be the battle of Europe I think <laughs> mate I've heard mate, I've seen a lot of Craig Dawson meme accounts in our comments in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks <laughs> since the draw was made but I'll never bet against Diego Carlos but we'll see who knows what Craig Dawson can Just can't wait for that five minutes in Diego Carlos the ball gets lumped up from kickoff. Craig Dawson and Diego Carlos steaming into each other in midfield for those of you by the way watching on uh, YouTube or listening on the podcast forgive the interruption the waitress at the bar that we're in rudely interrupted and demanded 
to take the empty pint glasses away that we're currently using up to prop up the camera. That's you lot over there. Um, so yeah, forgive me if I don't forget to edit this bit out. Uh, but game-wise, Dan, let's be serious for a little while. It's a huge game for West Ham. Obviously, with the away goals rule this season being taken out of it a bit, I don't know how how do you see it going. I, I don't think West Ham fans know how Sevilla play. What style of play can we expect? Given well, like how how does Sevilla play week in week out anyway? How do you expect them to play at the weekend? And given the additional, uh, I don't know, like uh, the, the additional drama, I guess, of the fact there's a two-legged tie without away goals. How do you see it going style-wise? So I would define Sevilla's game as possession-based defence. We are a team that don't create too many chances. The ones that we do create are very well worked and would be, you know, chances that you know you'd you'd hope to score. You know, we're not taking pot shots from outside the box or whatever, but we're very, very focused on controlling the ball, controlling the game, and that uh, contributes to our superb uh, defensive record. In terms of how the game will go, because West Ham. You know, I think West Ham will come at Sevilla, and I think that is the kind of game that favours us. Uh, we do suffer. You know, we just drew this weekend uh, against 19th place in La Liga. We do have a problem opening up lower team teams lower down who sit back. Exactly the same as West Ham this season, which is intriguing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Your your dad was saying that just before there, so. I'm going to assume that West Ham will come at us and give us a little bit more space than Alaves at the weekend. So I think our wingers will have a chance to to shine that perhaps they haven't done. Because coming into the game, you mentioned about West Ham's perform. We've drawn our last four games away from home. Two weeks ago, we had a win in the Derby, which keeps everyone content, certainly. But in the league, we've just had a slight drop-off. So I wouldn't say it's a VR coming into their best form either. But a game against West Ham, a team that... You know, two teams coming at each other. There will be space in the middle of the park and behind the defensive lines. Perhaps we'll not see as defensive a Sevilla as we might see in La Liga. One thing that I think is a big impact, or that will definitely influence the game, is that Sevilla are going through a ridiculous run in terms of injuries. So obviously we've mentioned uh, Anthony Marsh, uh, Martial. As things stands, it does not look like he will be taking part in the game, and he is one of, I think, about six or seven. We've been playing, there was games in January that we were playing with about 12 players out. It's ridiculous what's been happening at the club the last few months. And we're not. We're going into West Ham with what seems to be some very key players out. You know, the rumours are that uh, Fernando who is our, I was speaking about uh, some key players, I definitely should have mentioned him, he's a superb defensive midfielder, really the glue that keeps everything together. He perhaps mightn't be playing, and then we have Thomas Delaney definitely suspended, so in the case of Fernando weren't to play, we'd have no uh, official defensive midfielder, so Sevilla, I wouldn't, we're coming into it in decent form, and with a lot of injuries, so I think You know, for West Ham listeners out there, I think that's probably would be the hope that I would have, that we're missing, you know, some key players. But having mentioned the injuries, we still have been grinding out the results, but not to our maximum potential, I would say. That's, uh, I mean, Jared Bowen being out perhaps makes me think that the the wing attack or the wing threat the wide threat and the attacking threat from West Ham might be somewhat limited we've already chatted about it earlier today we'd snap anyone's arm off offering us a nil-nil or a one or draw from the away leg certainly um, Dan it's been absolutely brilliant chatting to you about all things Sevilla it's been great you obviously know your stuff about the club um, it's wicked having someone with a the UK accent I did think that uh, it might be a little bit more exotic to find some of the Spanish accent to talk about the club but I feel like for most people listening at home uh, that uh, hard, throaty port, port, porter down, <laughs> down tones has made people feel a bit comfortable um, as we always do at the end of all this it's going to be an absolutely wonderful occasion for all West Ham fans on Thursday night it sounds like Sevilla fans are treating it with equal respect which is absolutely superb as well uh, both teams sound like they've got injuries 
I don't know if both teams will be happy with a draw or not. West Ham fans, I think, certainly would be from the first leg to take it back to what will undoubtedly be an absolutely rocking London stadium next Thursday to try and hopefully see at home in what will be one of West Ham's greatest achievements and results in the modern era. But as we always do at the end of the opposition view, this has been by far and away, and no offence to any of the other ones, including Tim Wildwood, who we've got on tonight or this week for the Aston Villa view, my favourite opposition view ever, namely because I'm sitting outside a market square in Seville with a handheld microphone chatting to someone who actually works for Seville with my dad ahead of West Ham United playing away in the Europa League knockout stages, something I've dreamed about my whole life. So it's been my, by far and away my favourite. As we always do at the end of every opposition view, please, ahead of West Ham away to Sevilla in the Europa League, last 16 first leg on Thursday, what is your score prediction? For me, I'm going to go for 1-0 Sevilla. It's our result. We tend to win matches 1-0. We keep our clean sheet. We get our one goal and we're happy with that. So that's what I'm going to go for. Listen, Dan, normally I'd give you a bit of grief for betting against my own team on my own podcast but you have been an absolute treat to chat to and what a day to do it what a time to do it what a way to do it and what an occasion it's going to be and you know what I think secretly for all the three to 4,000 West Ham fans travelling out this week whether they're already in Seville like me and my dad are already or whether they're travelling out today some of you might even be listening to this as you're on the plane which I hope you are if you're doing that I think most of us don't tell anyone would take a one win defeat ahead of that game at London Stadium next week Dan social media big dog from Severe FC appreciate it for you it's been an absolute pleasure you giving us your time we appreciate it absolutely more than you could ever imagine and what an occasion this has been and it, I reckon I don't think unless West Ham do beat Severe and we get someone absolutely mammoth in the next round this could be my favourite opposition view of all time <laughs> so.